Today we're going to take a deeper look into integer arithmetic and logic instructions in the MIPS processor. All of these MIPS instructions use the R format, and many of them have immediate forms as well. Here they're grouped by their category, and we can see there's quite a diverse set of instructions. We have basic integer arithmetic, add, subtract, multiply, and divide in both a signed and an unsigned version. We have bitwise logical operations, and, or, exclusive, or, and nor, and we have shift instructions to shift all of the bits in a register left or right. When we learned addition as children, we learned first to count, and then we more or less memorized a lot of facts like 4 plus 5 is 9. And then we learned a set of rules, an algorithm, to add larger numbers. For example, to add 12 plus 89, we add 2 plus 9 and get 11. So we write the 1 and we have a carry. And then we add the carry plus 1 plus 8, which gives us 10. So we write the 0 and carry the 1. Computers, of course, represent numbers in binary, and they perform operation on bits to achieve addition, subtraction, or any of the other operations. So let's look at this binary operation, taking a naive approach first. First we add 0 and 1 and get 1. 0 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 1 is 0, carrier 1. And 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. So doing this one bit at a time would be very tedious and very time consuming. If this seems slow, realize that parallel circuitry can make this a very fast operation. We're not going to discuss implementation details in this course, but I'll just mention that this same parallel circuitry can be used to implement subtraction as well. If we wanted to manually subtract binary numbers, we could just convert the subtrahend to two's complement and add them. One other difference between human arithmetic and computer arithmetic is that there's no limit to the size of our arithmetic result as humans, but a computer has a limit of the word size. Let's look at arithmetic at the 4-bit level to make our discussion easier, but the same principles apply for any number of bits, as in the 32 bits of MIPS. If we have 4 bits, that gives us 2 to the 4 or 16 bit patterns. If we're interpreting our 4 bits as unsigned numbers, then we can represent numbers 0 to 15, as you can see over in this chart here. However, if we're interpreting these 4 bits as signed, we can represent from negative 8 to positive 7. So that's basically negative 2 to the n minus 1 to 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1 to account for the representation of 0. This wheel over here shows the two's complement representations. So half of the bits are reserved for positive numbers, and half of the bits are reserved for negative numbers. In a 32-bit word, we could represent approximately 4 billion numbers. For signed 32-bit operand, we could represent roughly negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. No matter what size our operands are, there's always the possibility that the result of an arithmetic operation won't fit in that representation. It will overflow. But exactly what happens depends on how we're interpreting the storage unit. Let's look at a couple of examples of integer arithmetic and see if there's overflow or not. In our first example, we're adding 0111 plus 0111. Let's just do the binary first. 1 and 1 is 0 with a carry. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1 carrier 1. And again, our carry of 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1 carrier 1. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. Now, is this overflow or not? That depends on how we're interpreting it. If we're interpreting these four bits as unsigned, then it's not an overflow. We added 7 to 7 and we got 14. No problem. However, if we're interpreting this as a signed operation, then we do have an overflow because we had a carry into the most significant bit, the sign bit. So essentially we added a positive number to a positive number and somehow we got a negative number. This is actually, if we look over here, negative 2. 
Let's look at another example of adding 1111 plus 0001. 1 and 1 is 0 with a carry. 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 Let's consider case 1 where we're interpreting this as unsigned. We added 15 plus 1 and we got 16, but we can't represent 16 in 4 bits, therefore that's an overflow. On the other hand now, let's interpret this as a signed operation. Notice that 1111 over here is negative 1. So we added negative 1 to positive 1 and we got 0. Don't worry about this extra bit here. The circuitry would take care of that. And recall that whenever you're adding a negative number and a positive number, you cannot have overflow. MIPS has two sets of add and sub. One will trigger an exception upon overflow, and the other will ignore it. Why is that the case? Well, some languages like C ignore overflow, so a MIPS compiler would use add u, sub u, etc. Other languages require raising an exception. In our code over here, we see that I've put the maximum positive integer into t0 and then added 1 with the add, not the add u, and we got an exception. Whenever you end up in coprocessor 0 over here instead of where we normally are with our register file, then you know you've had an exception. And this exception will give you a cause code. Most importantly, it will tell you which line caused the exception so you can figure out what went wrong. So if we wanted it to ignore the overflow, we would use add u instead of add. Notice also that when I'm talking about instructions, I put them in all caps. And when I'm typing them in code, I usually use lowercase. That's just a personal preference. It would work either way. Let's talk about integer multiplication. So when we're multiplying by 1, that just copies the first operand, as you see here. Then we shift over, and then we grab the next bit, which is 0. Multiplying anything by 0 is 0. Again, we shift. The next bit is 0. Here's more zeros. Finally, the upper bit here is 1. We just write the first operand, and then we can add. So if we were writing with 1s and zeros in base 10 or binary, it would be the same operation. Here's a flowchart for how to do multiplication in binary. Notice that for each bit position, we've got three steps. An add, a shift, and another shift. So if we're talking about 32 bits, that would be about 100 steps, which would be very slow. So the good news is that researchers have had decades to optimize addition and all of the other operations. So the circuitry performs the operations in parallel. And a similar thing is true for division. But the circuitry for division is a bit more complex. And although computer architects have been optimizing this for decades, a multiplication is still about three times slower than an addition. If we multiply a 32-bit register times another 32-bit register, that would give a 64-bit result. But we don't have a 64-bit register, so what they do instead is they use the high and low registers. High will hold the upper 32 bits of the result, and low will hold the lower 32 bits. Here are our instructions for multiply. Notice we've got a, a multiply and a multiply unsigned. So we multiply the two source operands, rs and rt, and the result will be in high and low. There is also a mul, which has a more familiar syntax here where we have a destination. This will also have the result in high-low, but it will copy the result to rd. So if you're confident you're multiplying small integers, this would be a good choice. So once we get half of the number in low and half in high, we need a way to move those into other registers, and so this move from high and move from low will do that. So the circuitry for multiplication will do what we do when we manually multiply numbers. If the two operands have the same sign, the result is positive, otherwise it's negative. You may not have noticed the high and low registers before, so here's a multi example. We're multiplying two very large numbers. I just made up some very large numbers. 
And we see that after the multiplication, we had values in both high and low. The high and low registers are the last two down here in our register file. We don't access those directly other than through the move from high and move from low instructions. Here's an example of a mull. I put two very small integers into t0 and t1 and then multiplied them, having t2 as my destination register. So I multiplied 2 by 3 and we see that t2 does have 6, but so does the low register. Here's a bit more lengthy example of code here, implementing b squared minus 4ac. So we've loaded values a, b, and c into s1, s2, s3, and 4 into t0. First we can do the b squared just by multiplying s2 by itself. And here I'm making the assumption that this would fit into 32 bits. So I'm just moving the result into t5. Now I'm multiplying 4 times a and again moving the result into t3. Here I'm multiplying 4 times a and moving the result into t3. Now we can multiply the 4 times the ac here and move the result back into t3. Finally we can subtract the two parts of this expression to get our result. So after each of these move from low instructions we should have checked if the high register had 0 in it just to be sure. Let's look at a quick demo of this just to see how these new instructions work. With these values in the expression b squared minus 4ac, I should get a value of 105. All right, so let's assemble, and then I'll skip through the loads. Let me go down here to the multiply, and we're going to multiply s2 times s2. So s2 has f in it, which is 15, and we'll do that. After that, we'll see we have a number here. My hex isn't that good, so let me uncheck the hexadecimal values, and we have 225. Okay, so that makes sense. So that's in our low. We want to move from low into T5 to hold it for later. And then we're going to multiply the 4 times A. Again, our result of 40 is down there in low, and we move it into T3. And now we're going to multiply that 4a that we had times the c. And again, move it from low into t3. Finally, we can subtract and store our results. And we see that we get the value we expected down here at 105. Let's look at the divide instructions. We have a divide and an unsigned divide that will divide the first operand by the second one. So we're going to use the high and low registers again, but in a very different way. For division, after the division, the high will hold the remainder and the low will hold the quotient. One thing to keep in mind is that there's no divide by zero checking, so no exception will be thrown. We would have to write an exception handler, which we'll talk about later in the course. Let's look at a quick example. I put 7 in T0, 2 in T1, and then I divided them. And we see that 7 divided by 2, that is 3, down here in low, with remainder 1. So I have a practice for you. I have a couple of simple expressions using addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So I'd like you to code these up in MIPS, and we'll talk about it next time in class. Next we're going to look at shift instructions, which just shift all bits in a register either right or left. There are two shift instructions, SLL for shift left logical and SRL for shift right logical. And we're finally going to be using that shift amount field in the R format. Let's look at shift left logical first. So the idea is that all of the bits are shifted left which means that some of the bits will just fall out and be gone. They're gone to the bit bucket. And it also means there'll be empty spaces on the right. And those will be filled with zeros. Each shift left of one position is the same as multiplying by 2. So let's confirm that with this code here. We put 2 in T2, and then we shifted left logical one time. And we see that the result 
went from two to four. Let's look at the machine code for that. The opcode and the function code for SLL are both zeros. The RS position is unused. RT is the source, RD is the destination. And our shift amount in this case was one. Some ISAs, instruction set architectures, have a no-op instruction. A no-op means don't do anything. MIPS uses SLL for no-op. As we see here, SLL000. This instruction does nothing. It has no side effects. First of all, shifting zero by zero does nothing. And zero can't be a destination register anyway. In fact, whenever you have zero as a destination register, it's a no-op. So why do we need a no-op? It turns out to be useful sometimes in embedded systems for creating simple delays. What do you think the machine code is for this instruction? If you guessed all zeros, you're correct. Let's look at SRL shift right logical. This instruction will move all the bits to the right, which means that bits will fall out and be lost on the right, and zeros will fill in on the left. So each SRL is the same as dividing by two with truncation, and that would work for positive integers only. Some ISAs have rotate instructions as well, which are like shifts, except the bits that fall off one end wrap around into the other end. Shift and rotate instructions are useful in encryption and compression algorithms. The register zero, which you can either spell out or use the number, turns out to be very handy. Recall that register zero is read-only and always contains zero. It can be used to copy registers. So here I wanted to copy the contents of T1 into T2. So one way to do that is just add zero to T1 and put the destination in T2. There is a move pseudo instruction in Mars. A pseudo instruction is put there as a convenience to programmers and it will be translated by the assembler into a real instruction. And so we see here two versions of doing the same thing, one with a real instruction, one with a pseudo instruction, and they will actually assemble into the same code. Another pseudo instruction that we've already been using is li for load immediate. And we've used it mainly for small constants. But what if we wanted to load a really big number? So we only have a 16-bit space in that i format. And what if our number is bigger than that? We can go ahead and use the pseudo instruction with however big a number we want, knowing that it will be translated into two real instructions. LUI for load upper immediate will load the upper half of the word, and then ORI will load the lower half of the word. In a similar way, the LA pseudo instruction helps us load a 32-bit address. So we can just do something like load address into some register of a label, and it will translate into a load upper immediate, so the upper half of the address, and then the OR will fill in the lower half of the address. Notice that when these pseudo instructions assemble into real instructions, you'll often see register 1. That's register AT, the assembler temporary, which we don't use. We let that be reserved for the assembler. Next, we look at logical instructions. These are bitwise operations. The AND will yield a 1 in the result only if both bits of the operand are 1. So when we AND these two numbers here, we see that we have a 1 only where both operands were 1. The OR yields a 1 in the result if either bit is 1. When we OR these two numbers, we see that all of the result bits are 1. Exclusive OR yields a 1 in the result if one but only one of the operands has a 1. So we see that they're all 1 except this one right here where they were both 1. The NOR yields a 1 in the result if both of the operands have a 0. The NOR is essentially an OR with an inverter. When these two numbers are NORed together, the only place where we have a 1 is when both operands were 0. MIPS didn't implement a NOT, so you may be thinking, why not? The reason is that their approach is to have the minimal instruction set. And you can achieve the same thing as, as a NOT with a NOR, as we can see in this example. So if we want to invert 
t1, all we have to do is nor that with zero. So this is first ORed, and anything that you OR with zero is just itself and then inverted. And we see that in this code here. We have 555, five, five, etc. So that's just 0, 1, 0, 1, and so forth. And after we invert it, we see the opposite. We have AAA, which is 1010. Zero, zero. We can use AND, or the immediate version AND I, to set certain bits to zero. This example only has zeros in certain locations. This is sometimes called a mask. And so it will force bits 0 and 2 to be 0 and leave all other bits unchanged. Because when we AND something with a 1, it's unchanged. When we AND it with a 0, it's set to 0. In a similar way, we can use OR or the immediate version OR I to force certain bits to 1. This example forces bits 1 and 3 to be 1, leaving all others unchanged. So with the OR, if we want a bit to be unchanged, we OR it with 0, and if we want it to be forced to 1, we OR it with 1. This is an overview of a MIPS processor, and we've been over here in the integer unit. Later in the course, we'll get over to the floating point unit, so we covered a lot of ground today, arithmetic operations, shift operations, and bitwise logic operations. We'll practice these in class. Until then, happy coding! Mm -hmm.